Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for Ballet and the Arts. I'm Jennifer Homans, the founder and director of the center, and I'm very happy to welcome you here tonight for this event with Brian Siebert. I'm not going to do a long introduction. You have information about the center on your chairs. And many of you already know about us. Please uh, inform yourselves and come to our future programs, and um, we hope to see you again. Um, I'm also not going to do a long introduction of Brian, because most of you have read him. Uh, he's, of course, the dance critic for the New York Times, and he has a full bio that you have sitting there. But I would like to just say that I, he is also the author of a book that I, I just think is wonderful. Um, what the Eye Hears, A History of Tap Dancing. This is, an, this is uh, an important book, and to me it's important like all good works, great works of cultural history, because it is about not only about tap dancing, but about the people who made tap dancing and about the society that made tap dancing, and uh, therefore also about the history of race in America. So um, I hope that you have the book, and if you don't, you will have it, and I uh, will read it, and we're very, very honored to have Brian here with us tonight to talk to us about a, s a small piece a uh, subject related and in his book as well. So, uh, Brian, I'm going to just turn it over to you now and uh, please welcome Brian Seymour. Oh my God. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, when Jennifer asked me if I might like to give a talk here, I thought, why not talk about ballet and tap? Uh, it's a subject I touch on in my book, but I thought it might be interesting in this context to carve it out as a discrete topic and push on it a little bit harder. Uh, one major advantage of a talk like this over a book is that I can show you footage of what I'm talking about, and that's how I want to start, uh, if we can. Sorry. Um, I might as well take this moment to say that I had a terrible afternoon of technical <laughs> snafus. Uh, I had to bring my own lap, my own uh, desktop in because my wouldn't transfer. And uh, uh, our gentleman here is uh, frantically trying to uh, cover up my mistakes. So. Uh, sure. and then we'll move on to something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or I'll just tell you what it is. Yeah. That's it. That's good enough. <laughs> Technique of the ballet that won't actually this other 
Let's we stop it here. Stop it here. <laughs> so that's one of the first scenes in Shall We Dance from 1937, the sixth Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers movie. As you can see, Astaire's character is an American ballet dancer pretending to be a Russian one in Paris. Secretly, subversively, he's te been teaching himself to tap dance. And this desire of his to, quote, combine the technique of ballet with the warmth and passion of this other mood, that's our subject today, combining ballet and tap dancing, why would you want to do such a thing? Well, Astaire's, that was a joke, actually, by the way. Um, <laughs> Astaire's character has a good reason. He's in love with the character played by Ginger Rogers, uh, even though at this point he's only seen her dancing in a flip book. She is a Ginger Rogers type dancer, and if he wants to dance with her, he had better learn some tap. That is, he better become like Fred Astaire. And at the end of the movie, um, he does put on a number combining Astaire style with ballet, and if we can cue it up, it looks like this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Harriet Hochter. And you get some of this. And even some of this. Well, hmm. the number does get a little better after that. Uh, Astaire comes out and he sings and he taps and Ginger shows up and they dance a little bit to reconcile and tie up the ending. Um, the whole number, in fact, is framed as a choice between ballet, represented as we've seen by the contortionist Harriet Hochter, and uh, musical comedy and tap, represented by Ginger Rogers. In other words, it's rigged. Uh, and that's generally how these things went in those days. This is a popular American territory, and ballet is the highbrow European visitor to be flirted with, but only a little. Uh, that's one reason that the film is interested in the mixture of ballet and tap. It's about class, as in you say either, I say either, which they sing in this film, and as in she gives him sex and he gives her class, as Catherine Hepburn famously said of the pairing. 
The mixture idea allows the filmmakers to borrow some of the prestige of European culture only to reject it. The film is not really that interested in ballet. Uh, as you can see, the notion of ballet in 1937 Hollywood was still rather impoverished. Uh, and this is the major problem with most contemporaneous, contemporaneous mixtures of tap and ballet, the poor quality of the ballet ingredients. Uh, here, we're going to go back a little bit. This is uh, in the 1920s. Ned Wayburn, the fellow on the left, uh, was one of the big dance directors. He had been for decades already, staging musical comedies and reviews like Ziegfeld's Follies. And he ran the biggest chorus girl factory in America. He also made some routines for the Astaires when they were kids in vaudeville. In his book, The Art of Stage Dancing, he characterized musical comedy dancing as, quote, a cross between the ballet and the Ned Wayburn type of tap. Uh, but by ballet, he meant Ned Wayburn's modern Americanized ballet, which he promised, quote, eliminates the long and tedious training formerly considered necessary and fits a pupil for stage appearance in the briefest possible time. <laughs> Uh, for an idea of what that might have looked like, at its best, at its best, we can watch Weyburn's top pupil, Marilyn Miller. She was the ingenue queen of musical comedy in the 1920s. She did tap and she did ballet. Uh, what we're going to see is uh, from the 1929 film of Sally, which had been her big Broadway hit in 1921. Uh, so we might be seeing her past her prime. This is, this is 1921 uh, and definitely in a different medium. Uh, but this is it. A little bit of tap, a little bit of ballet. Sorry for the poor quality. So here, tap and ballet are separate. Tap is for horsing around, and ballet, it's actually a butterfly ballet, is the culmination of the fairy tale Cinderella ending. Uh, mixing could be much, much, much worse. Uh, what we're going to see next is uh, the title number from the 1928 film, The Broadway Melody. This is a little piece of it. Uh, and that was the first film musical, Broadway Melody. I don't think the cat ears are actually essential. That's just extra. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a skill. Right? <laughs> uh, this freak hi hybrid toe tap was actually fairly common as a vaudeville gimmick. Uh, it's an excellent reason to be wary of any mixing of ballet and tap. Terrible things can happen. I, I think the close up really magnifies the awfulness. Uh, but by 1937, there was hope for better. Hope for better than Harriet Hochter. Hope for better choreographers than Harry Losey, who choreographed um, the number in Shall We Dance, who seems to have had no ballet background at all and who went on to direct ice skating shows. Uh, Arlene Croce, in her Esther Rogers book, writes that the director of, of Shall We Dance tried to get Massine. Uh, John Mueller, in his Esther book, says that the producer had tried to get George Balanchine. 
a real figure from the Russian ballet who once said that he had come to America because it was the country that produced Ginger Rogers. Balanchine also greatly admired Astaire, and the prospect of their working together is one of the great what-ifs of dance history. That's not what we got in Shall We Dance, though, but it might have something to do with why Shall We Dance was made. The previous year, Balanchine had choreographed the Rodgers and Hart musical On Your Toes on Broadway. Uh, Rodgers and Hart had originally conceived the idea as a film for Astaire. The plot is an, another example of 1930s anxious populism. The hero is a son of vaudevillians who have pushed him to become a professor of music, though he really wants to be a hoofer. He helps out a Russian ballet troupe and is seduced by the ballerina, but returns in the end to his nice American girl. In On Your Toes, ballet was mostly parodied. There was a parody of Scheherazade in it. But the climactic show within the show is a jazz ballet, Slaughter on 10th Avenue. It would become famous for beginning to integrate dance into the plot of a musical, since the hero knows that there's some gangsters are supposed to shoot him on the final chord, so he keeps the orchestra playing the final bars over and over again as he comically exhausts himself. But for our purposes today, it's more important that the hero is tap dancing. Um, Balanchine knew next to nothing about tap dancing. He had a black tap assistant, Herbert Harper, but the guy who was playing the hero was Ray Bolger. Uh, many of you may only know Ray Bolger as the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz, but he was a great comic dancer, and in my opinion, a great tap dancer. He came out of a line of eccentric dancers. Uh, There's a whole tradition of funny guys who tap danced. Uh, but when he was growing up in Boston, he didn't just learn steps on the sidewalk, he took a ballet class from a Russian immigrant who had fled the Soviet Union. It was starting to be possible to get a better ballet education in America than you could get from Ned Wayburn. Uh, of course, when Bolger did ballet, it looked funny, so he became a comic dancer. Uh, but as he said, the training helped since he knew what he was parodying. His parodies of tap were equally deadly. As a mixture of tap and ballet, Slaughter on 10th Avenue is better than most, definitely better than Shall We Dance. The problem with most performances of the work, which became part of the repertory at New York City Ballet, is poor tap training. Ballet dancers who don't have the tap technique to make the ending work. And when I wrote that sentence, I didn't know that some members of New York City Ballet would be in the audience. Um, nevertheless, I stand by it. Um, the choreography depends on the dancer because the tap choreographer, the tap choreography, in my opinion, is not, is, it, it isn't much. Balanchine didn't know tap, as I said. Uh, in, in the 1938 film, Goldwyn Follies, he also made a Romeo and Juliet ballet in which the Montague Capulet divide is figured as ballet versus tap. It ends with a happy reconciliation, a mixture, but the, the, the ingredients are slight and underexplored. You get the sense that it didn't really engage Balanchine's mind. But he was in America, and he and Lincoln Kirsten had founded the School of American Ballet, which meant that ballet education in America was certainly improving. And the School of American Ballet was crucial to a dancer at the center of today's topic, Paul Draper. Draper came at the ballet tap mixture from the tap side, but he was on the opposite end of the class divide from most tap dancers. He was born in 1909 in Italy, where his father, a tenor from a socially prominent American family, was studying bel canto. Soon the family moved to London, where his mother, Muriel, established an artist salon with guests that included Arthur Rubinstein, Pablo Casals, Henry James, Gertrude Stein. The sound of Rubinstein's piano and Casals cello seeped under the door of young Draper's nursery. But there was a divorce, and Paul was shipped around to boarding schools where he excelled academically and misbehaved. Expelled from two schools, he ran away from a third. Later, having dropped out of a civil engineering college, he took a TAF class. As he later put it with characteristic dry candor, I thought it would be a soft way to make money and a good way to show off. I wanted to do something you didn't have to study, and I thought dancing was something you didn't have to study. <laughs> TAP, he thought, was a natural way to express myself. So he went to London, and he failed there. And he failed in France. And he came back to the US, and there, an anonymous donor paid for his salary at the Sutton Club. I think the donor was his mother, but I don't have proof of that. Um, that gig led to more at the Casino de Paris and the Radio City. He looked like a class act. He was a draper. Not many hoofers were profiled in town and country magazine. One of his mother's lovers, E.E. E. Cummings, wrote a poem about him. 
But it's what happened next that is most germane to today's subject. Draper began to practice hard, four to seven hours a day, devising the most difficult steps he could and striving to dance faster than anyone else. But at some point, he sensed a dead end in the direction of speed and difficulty. He set about experimenting with pieces in the classical tradition, the music he had grown up with. He wanted to expand, and ballet, he later said, seemed the most available way of expanding. Every time he tried to make a step more meaningful, it came out to him looking like ballet. Well, here's another reason to mix ballet and tap. Because you feel that ballet has something that tap doesn't. Next slide, please. And so, even as Draper was headlining at the Waldorf and the Plaza, he attended classes at the School of American Ballet. There are more connections. Uh, Lincoln Kirsten had been a regular at Muriel Draper's New York Salon. And in 1941, Paul Draper would marry a Balanchine ballerina, Heidi Vossler. Uh, for those of you who know Balanchine's serenade, I think that Vossler was the original woman carried off at the end. Um, one of her daughters also told me that she used to brag about being Balanchine's first American conquest. But back to Draper and ballet. Uh, he was in his mid-twenties, which is quite late to start, even for a man. But he took from ballet what he needed. Placement, positions, steps. Uh, adding, for example, the high swinging leg of a grand battement to tap swing steps. More important, I think, though, are other things he took from ballet. Its rigor, its systematic methods for broadening expressive powers, isolating the muscles. And, um, he learned how to be analytical, how to break down steps into component parts, isolating the muscles involved, working toward the efficiency of movement that creates the illusion of effortlessness. Its principle was control moving as he chose to, not as gravity or habit demanded, getting the rhythm and the motion he desired without distorting either. What did this look and sound like? Well, Draper went to Hollywood too, and he appeared in the 1936 Ruby Keeler film Colleen in a routine he choreographed for himself and the star, and we can watch it.
<laughs> exactly. Uh, I would be curious during the Q&A or the reception afterwards to hear what some of you think of that. Um, to me, it's clever, clear, sort of funny. Uh, Draper's style is light, crisp, but also kind of brittle. Uh, the dancing strikes me as timid, aiming for delicacy and, aiming and arriving at half-finished, kind of. Uh, even taking into account how much Draper probably had to adjust for his partner, who really did have no ballet training, his dancing still looks to me like someone who started ballet too late, and rather than expanding, it seems kind of stiff or uh, restricted, pat patrician. Um, in any case, we can probably all agree that Draper, who had a stutter, is, was not musical comedy star material. Um, Warner Brothers told him, told him as much and never hired him again. But that wasn't quite the end of his Hollywood career. In 1945, Paramount, Paramount cast him opposite Bing Crosby in Blue Skies. Crosby got him fired, uh, reportedly because of some obnoxious comment he made to their female co-star, but uh, that couldn't have been too difficult when the actor who replaced Draper was Fred Astaire. Oh. Three years later, Draper took a role in a James Cagney film of The Time of Your Life. Uh, this role, Harry the Hoof Huffer, was a bit part, but it was the role that Gene Kelly had played on Broadway in 1939. And that had been Kelly's breakout role, the one in which he learned how to play a character through tap. Harry is supposed to be a comedian who isn't funny, a small-time dancer with a big heart. Is that good? An average Joe asks about his tapping. I don't know, answers another, but it's honest. Let's watch a little bit. It all takes place in this bar. May I speak to the Chelsea Naval people? You Nick? I am Nick. Did you use a space media proofprint? Me? You were much funny about you. I did, but you can't. Not do me a worry, Mr. All I need is a cigar. Do you supply it? Yeah! All right, get fun. Okay. Now, I'm standing on the corner of Third Park. I'm looking around. I'm speaking it up. It's all there, right in front of me. The whole city. The whole world. I see people going by. They're going somewhere. I don't know where they're going, but they're going. I ain't going anywhere. Next thing you know, I'm figuring it out. All right, I'm in. A fat guy bumped into an old lady. They were in a hurry. They bumped. Boom! What does it mean? Can we skip to the next one? All right. Okay, what's going on here? Uh, again, I'm very curious to hear what you think, but to me, this is so unfunny. It's almost funny. I, I can't tell if Draper is acting ineptly or brilliantly. Uh, one complication is that what he's doing there, this political speech, was a famous part of his nightclub act, which the tough-minded New Yorker satirist Walcott Gibbs claimed was a more hilarious and biting as political satire than anything done with words. So what Draper's doing in that film, is it self-parody? Or was that what he really looked like? The question nags me because these are pretty much the only film records of Draper in his prime. 
And for me, they don't nearly match up to the critical record. For Draper, I have to tell you now, uh, after you've watched the clips, was a critical darling. In, the 1940, in 1942, the Saturday Evening Post cited as common opinion Draper's ranking as the best tap dancer in the world. This is in 1942. Astaire is still in his prime. Bill Robinson is still going. John Bubbles and still you know, obscure black tap dancers like Baby Lawrence are coming up, but they say he is the best tap dancer in the world. Most people put him above that. One of the major achievements to come out of our American theater. The Washington Post said that to denominate him a tap dancer is a desecration. Critics imagined Draper moving tap up into the realm of serious art, solacing and stirring and elevating. I suspect this kind of talk had much to do, as, as much to do with critical attitudes about tap as it did about Draper. In 1941, the dance critic Walter Terry wrote an article about the low opinion of tap among, quote, serious dance lovers. These were still the days when modern dance, modern dance fans believed ballet to be frivolous and passé, corrupt and ill-suited for democracy, while ba ballet fans judged modern dance clumsy, faddish, and probably Bolshevik. Yet both camps could band together in their contempt for the popular form. Terry stressed how tap was limited, limited in music, quote, the popular and ephemeral tunes of the day, limited in range of expression, quote, about the only human quality it projects is good spirits, limited in technique, quote, there is a limited number of things that can be said with the feet. Terry also complained about tap posture, that of an anthropoid ape. And he expressed his hope for tap to become, quote, a valid facet of American dance art. And who embodied these hopes for him? Paul Draper. Ladies and gentlemen, this is snobbery. Now, I'm a New York Times critic. I'm a snob. But I guess they made snobs, they, I think they make snobs differently now than they did then. Terry's ideas sound to me like a middle brow overestimations of European models over American ones. They sound like prejudice about high and low, missing the distinctions of quality within those categories. I wrote a large book explaining how much I think Walter Terry was missing, both acknowledging and refuting all of those limitations before I even get to Paul Draper. Some critics had reservations back then. Edwin Denby, the critic of that time whom I trust the most, found Draper's academic arm work stiff in the shoulders and neck, which is how it looks to me in the footage. Denby also acknowledged the conflicts involved in the ballet tap mixture, the way that the bent knees and loose ankles required for sound production blunt ballet's taut extensions. He might have said more about weight, for example. There's a story about Eleanor Powell. Uh, you all know where Eleanor Powell was, the movie. I mean, she was growing up as a snotty ballet student, but uh, getting to New York, she learned that she needed to tap if she wanted to work. So she went to tap class, and she struggled with tap, until a teacher cinched an army belt around her waist and attached a sandbag to each side. It made her sink, which is what tap dancers do. That's what distinguishes them from Irish dancers who bob, you know. Um, I don't mean to say that a tap has to be heavy-footed, though a stair was, uh, but the connection to the ground is different from ballet. It's more African, and uh, it's hard not to hear a racial edge in that comment about anthropoid ape posture. Uh, a tap dancer gives that up at great peril. Uh, one source of the title of my book is actually a quote from Draper's. He said, what the eye sees is sharpened by what the ear hears, and the ear hears more clearly what sight enhances. That's at the core of what tap does, music and dance. But his idea of tap, influenced by his idea of ballet, has too little bottom for me, not enough bass. Um, I should say that Denby also noted D Draper's charm, refined, innocent in a touching way, I'm entirely willing to believe that this does not come through in the films. For Draper was very popular, stopping the show while dancing to Bach and Broadway reviews and nightclubs. His manner was friendly and formal. He said things like, let's have a great big hand for Mr. Bach. He gave people a little culture with their entertainment and they loved him for it. The young Bob Fosse was a wide-eyed fan. In the 40s, he teamed up with Larry Adler, a virtuoso of the harmonica, and the pair of them sold out Carnegie Hall and other big symphony halls across the country. It's at this point that Draper's biography gets a little bit off our topic because he and Adler were accused of being communists, which was a very big deal in 1948.
Their libel suit, which was covered heavily in all the papers, resulted in a hung jury, but the damage was done. They were blacklisted. Adler left for England and never came back. Draper left too, and when he came back, it was hard to find work. His career never fully recovered, but he did perform at the 92nd Street Y, for example, introducing such pieces as his Sonata for Tap Dancer, that 17 minutes of a cappella tap in which he develops themes and suggested melodies. He went into teaching, though apparently his classes were not very popular because they were so damn difficult. I think um, actually one of our one of Draper's students is here with us today, and uh, he may join in the discussion later. Um, Draper also taught in another way through articles about, quote, a serious approach to tap dancing in Dance Magazine. These pieces set a very high standard. Uh, in, it, in them, he insists on the study of ballet and music preceding the study of tap. He speaks in terms of thousands of hours of training, over 10, 20 years. He is very frank. Few students learn how to dance no matter how you teach them. It's the kind of thing he says. I love this serious approach to tap dancing, fighting against tap amateurism. But I don't love the kind of snobbery that comes with it. Interviewed in later years, Draper expressed admiration for Astaire and for Bill Robinson, but he thought their dancing had little value in itself. The value was in the performer. He disparaged Robinson's African-American airs as entertaining, but not having much to do with dancing. It isn't going to go any place, he said. It hasn't a design or a structure. This is a kind of Lincoln Kirsten way of thinking about tradition that is deaf and blind to the majesty of tap dancing. Of course, there were things that black tap dancers might have learned from Draper had their eyes and ears had been opened to him. Uh, but as it turned out, Draper was the one who was generally ignored. For a while in the 50s, there was a little vogue of ballet tap, but it faded as tap faded. And in the 70s, when a new generation resurrected jazz tap, there were few people interested in picking up Draper's baton. Um, Mr. Everett, who's here, uh, was one, and he may speak to us about that in a minute. Uh, in Canada, there was uh, William Orlowski, who modeled his National Tap Dance Canada Company of Canada on Draper. Uh, Orlowski learned and performed Draper solos, and Draper actually even made a piece for the company. When I interviewed Orlowski a few years ago, his attitude sounded like Draper's. He kept telling me how classless tap was today. We'll have to wait for another lecture for me to talk about how tap was pushed out of Broadway, pushed out of Broadway in the 1940s by ballet. Not pushed out entirely, but pushed to the side as ballet trained choreographers like Agnes DeMille and Jerome Robbins took over. It's curious to me how as dance was integrated into the story, picking up on that idea from on, on your toes, Tap was judged incapable of handling that role. Was it something about the shoes, or the narrow associations, or about what kind of people were best at tap dancing? Let's see. There'll be a time. Um, I'm going to skip ahead, though, from all that and look at one more dancer. Uh, Sam Weber grew up dreaming of being a concert tap, tap dancer, like Paul Draper. But in the 1960s, that didn't seem to be a viable career option. He studied in San Francisco with Stan Kahn, a vaudevillian who had developed a systematic teaching system breaking down the mechanics of tap. Uh, Rodney Strong, a student of Draper's who later ran a California vineyard, maybe you've tasted his wine, um, also taught at Kahn's studio. Kahn made his studi students study ballet, and Sam Weber, his ace pupil, resisted at first. But ballet made more sense as a career, and Weber spent the 70s in the employ of various ballet troops. Then another option appeared. The Jazz Tap Ensemble, founded in 1978. This was a concert tap company, company. And when Weber saw them perform, he thought, that's what I always wanted to do. When one of the original members left, he jumped at the opening. So we can watch him now at the Joyce Theater in 1998. Is it there? It's not there. You can watch him at home on YouTube at the Joyce Theater 1998. And uh, what you'll find, you can also find clips of him uh, performing. Yeah. Is it there? Or oh, you can watch him right now. Very black, yeah.
Sam Weber. So you can also find clips of him performing to Bach, but I picked this one because of the versatility. It shows the mix better. Um, you can see ballet in the lifted torso and the alignment, um, but the port de bras are, are much fuller and more fluid than Draper's, I think, although still a little stiff for my taste. Um, there's also a ballet sensor's, uh, dancer's sense of enchaînement, I think, in the way he threads the steps together and swirls them around the stage. Uh, but maybe most important, the tap bass isn't narrow. 
He's assimilated steps and techniques and style from tap masters such as Honey Coles and Jimmy Slide and Steve Kondos. It's an ultra-efficient style and the filigree sometimes obscures the pulse. It's a mild charm. He was no more likely to be a musical comedy star than Draper was. The concert stage is his home. Weber takes from ballet what he needs. What does tap need from ballet? Well, more than anything, I'd say it needs money or the prestige that attracts money. A few years ago, I read somewhere that ballet is dead. Uh, I think that was meant metaphorically, artistically, institutionally, it's still thriving. New York City Ballet, American Ballet Theater, many, many r regional ballet troops. Taps, not so much. Uh, there is a school of American ballet. There is no school of American tap. There is a jazz at Lincoln Center. There is no tap at Lincoln Center. Almost none of the concert tap companies like Jazz Tap Ensemble there that started in the 70s and the 80s are still around. There are other hopeful signs, which I can talk about if we want to, but tap is still marginal. There is no center for tap and the arts. Maybe that's one reason for me to come here and give a talk. <laughs> I think we're going to do a Q&A now. <laughs> Um, actually, to start the Q&A, um, Mr. Everett, would you like to come up and talk? Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I really would. Sure, sure. <laughs> could, you, could you introduce yourself to the crowd, yes. please? No, I will. I think we have a microphone for you. Oh, okay. That was just magnificent. Oh, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Yes, I don't think this is on, though. Ah. Okay. Does anybody here know me? Nobody. That's good. Um, I was with Paul since age 11. Uh, his last tap shoes were given to me by his daughter, uh, acclaiming me the only man qualified and deserving of carrying on his work. Um, there is no interest in it. Um, I don't think this is working. I don't think, but we can hear him, right? It is working? Okay. It is? Okay. Uh, Paul would have been the last one to care. He laughed through adversity. Uh, when he was destroyed by McCarthyism, he <laughs> didn't care. I was at his wife's memorial in his house, and he told charming stories about Heidi. And um, he lived in Switzerland during that time, and not a penny was sent to him by the Draper family. That irked him, nothing else. But when I met him, he was teaching at the studios on the Steinway Hall, 52nd Street at 54th. I was 11, and nobody came. He was blacklisted. Uh, there were a few who would drop in now and then, but nobody stayed. Those guys are still around. One's teaching in Vermont, I think. Rod Strong used to come occasionally. Tommy Rawl, uh, Timmy Everett. Uh, a lot of people came. Uh, they came in to hug him and bow down to the master, really. Uh, when I auditioned for Gower Champion, they said, he said to me, who made up that routine? I said, Paul Draper. He went, oh, you're hired. Uh, Paul was known by people that mattered. I was at a party in London, and uh, uh, this is after I found nobody in America gave a damn about Draper anymore. Uh, but I do, and I always will. I think he's the only artist in tap. Uh, in his way. Uh, I, I give it to Bubbles, I give it to everybody else, but the man who, who can claim that he made it into an eternal aesthetic, incorporating the whole body and the leaning forward, as well as the anthropoid, he included it all. Uh, he had passion. Uh, he marched with Pete Seeger on marches. He, his dances <coughs> had social causes in them. I never saw a, a tap dancer <coughs> care about social causes, but Paul? He, he educated me about everything, poetry, opera, everything, uh, but, but <coughs> lightly and with a few, few words because he, he stuttered, so he didn't talk well. So when he talked, you better listen because that was the last time you're going to hear it. So he trained me to peel my eyes and listen. <coughs> okay, do I have to quit? No, but I do want to ask you one, one question. Yes. I want to ask you a question. Please. Which is, can you speak to what I was talking about? Like yes. this discrepancy between... I, I never saw him. Yes. All I have is that. 
that is an atrocity. Okay. <laughs> oh, because Paul would always tell us, when we would discover about that movie, he would go like this. He said, I was still a drunken gazelle. <laughs> that was his way to describe himself in that movie. He, he hated it. And there is no footage on Paul, except the last one put out by the Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania Governor's Art Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Arts. And Paul improvises in that. You should see it. He was in his late 70s there. Uh, it's a few bars, but that's better than anything that I've ever seen of him. Uh, I saw him in performance. Con I saw him every day for three hours dance uh, for years and years. And then we were friends until his last week in the hospital. Uh, I think I was the last person he spoke to. Um, and his last words were, I love you all. That's the last... I don't know who he was talking to. He, he said it to the world. I love you all. Uh, so he was a man who lived for um, social causes as well as tap dancing. And uh, there is a portrait of him, Kirstein, and Balanchine, a dark portrait of men in deep melancholy looking out over Central Park in Kirsten's dr drawing room uh, over the mantel in his daughter's fireplace. I, I never knew who it was until I went up there. Uh, they, they shared a very artistic view and a very uh, uplifting, bright view about the, the future of mankind. Uh, he, he was misunderstood completely and he didn't care. Uh, what a, the minute you stepped into his class, you got, hello, and you ran up and hugged him and that was it because he couldn't talk, you know. Uh, uh, his classes were so hard. The first day I took, I was 11 years old. He did not have any mercy. He showed it to you once, and that's it. You got about 60 combinations a class. The bar was out of this word difficult. I mean, at you 11. You started with a ballet bar. Right? Oh, no, you started with a 10-minute warm-up that was a killer. Pilates, forget it. Paul's warm-up of 10 minutes, I still teach to this day. It was joyous. The pianists were the best in the world. He fired a lot of them right on the spot. Did I tell you to do that? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. My, my, the question I'm wondering is, you know, where did he, where did the way he moved oh. position him socially, politically, not politically, but mo more, you know, within the tap world and within the world of uh, what tap meant? Every day, Paul explained how he came up with the steps he did by the way he would, for instance, to do a wing, you practice the side of your foot against the wall as hard as you could during the day to develop your outward flexor muscle. I mean, there, he invented thousands of little techniques nobody had ever thought of. I mean, I, I could thrill you with an hour lesson right now you wouldn't believe. Things no other tap dancer even thinks of. The first day, he said to me, all right, three against five. First day. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three. Five into four now. Uh, right away, that's... My first audition for, for Jerome Robbins, I got the job instantly because we had to do five against four in the, in the background scene in, um, in the gym dance. And I had it right away. Nobody else had that five, four. Paul Mr. Tried. Everett was in West Side Story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I, I could, I, if, uh, Paul used to say, that people, why don't, Paul used to say, people ask me to form a tap company. The reason I don't is I don't have the money. Anybody reading this article, article is free to mail in cash, but he never had the money for a company. And I really don't think TAP is a, is a group effort. I think it's a total solo art form. You cannot have two people tap dancing together uh, unless you're doing trades, but when they're trying to do in tandem, one of them is off. You can't do it. He tried. So you have to look at it as an, a, a virtuosity of one person. Like a, uh, it's like no other thing I ever saw. Uh, uh, flamenco you can have a company doing, but not tap. Uh, uh, Paul's taps were handmade. They were, they were built of an alloy from Bethlehem steel. He invented the alloy. Paul was an engineer. 
When the taps arrived, 12 pairs, he shaved them down to an eighth of an inch by hand, and he counted how many shaves per tap by hand. He got a last from a, a friend, a, 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 a shoemaker, and did his own taps. He shaped them smaller than the palm of my hand, and the heel tap was about the size of two thumbnails. And with that, you made all the sounds so much like Laurence Olivier's voice in a soliloquy. When you sat in the last row, uh, let's say, of Beckett and heard Laurence Olivier, you heard every word, and he whispered. That was Paul. Uh, there, I can't explain. The, the, I, I think he was a genius. Yes. Yeah, I could go on for 10 hours. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I'm monopolizing. Yes. Well. Yeah, I think we need to pass around that. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Sure Thank you. Time, right? No, sure. I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. So, other questions? Where does Gene Kelly come into? I mean, we didn't. You didn't talk about him. Um, I didn't talk about Gene Kelly. Is it just um, he had I classical could have talked about him, if, especially if I was going to talk about the like why did it go off Broadway? Uh, because the one person who was interested in developing tap choreography in that direction was Gene Kelly, and he went to Hollywood. Um, what else do you want me to say no, about No, I mean, Gene just Kelly? because he had a very, you know, classical training. Right. No, and, and uh, so you know, know, if you look in some of I his films, you, you can see that he, he could have been a, a, a ballet dancer, much more so than Astaire, who really didn't have any ballet training almost at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, he didn't go there. Uh, I do talk about him a lot in the book, and um, for me, some, he, you know, he went, he actually, at the end of his career, uh, Kelly, that is, um, did much more for ballet than he did for tap. He made this movie, you know, Invitation to the Dance, which uh, was a remarkable movie in, in having ballet as a film. Um, but at that point, ballet didn't need the help. Tap needed the help. Um, other questions? Here, in the second row. Oh, over there. I just wanted to say, as, as Draper was misrepresented, so was Harriet Hochter. Um, ah. So those of us in Boston studying in the 60s and 70s had the great honor of taking, you know, at Boston Ballet, having our private lessons with Harriet Hochter, Joyce Cuoco, and, you know, just a whole bunch, bunch of us. And she was a wonderful choreographer and so musical. Ah. But, of course, they were simply yeah. using the, yeah, the snake thing. back and being on point. Yeah, but just that's, a plug for Harriet. Yeah, that's amazing. I'd love to... <laughs> I was, I was interested in your question about uh, what tap needs from ballet, but I wondered about the reverse. What does ballet need from tap? Um, I don't know. Uh, rhythm? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe another way to ask it. Yeah. Oh, oh, for rhythm, and I mean, also everybody knows how. Uh, what, she asked, "Why is Balanchine interested in?" And everybody knows how much Balanchine took from black dancers. Um, I mean, um, one thing I thought about talking about here is his w working with the Nicholas Brothers in the '30s, um, and there it's like two, two people like just learning from each other, like rubbing off on each other, basically. Um, that is the the what Balanchine is picking up from the Nicholas Brothers and what the Nicholas Brothers are picking up from him. That's, that's more my idea of like a more ideal mix, way of mixing these things, which is organic, uh, not uh, uh, a grafting or a, a forced hybrid. They obviously learn from each other. You know. uh, I was just curious, you said I think Paul Draper and Sam Weber their arms were a little stiff for you. Yeah. Is there a dancer that for you best embodies the melding of ballet and tap? Oh, you know, I, I don't know I've ever seen one, actually. Do you have one? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when you moved in 
that when Paul moved his hands had the weight of two clubs, each finger had weight of the red weight. And when they moved, they would show you a whole horizon of nature, the trees. And um, I said to Paul, how, how do you move your hands? He said, study Walden's Pond. Study Thoreau. That was his answer. Go, go try that. Yeah. <laughs> I, did. I went and read it. It's about paying attention. Pay attention every moment you're alive. That's how his hands move. He couldn't make a move without those hands just embracing it. His, his arms had, his fingers had such expression. I asked the psychiatrist what impressed him most about Fred Astaire. She said his hands. And he hated his hands. I know. Fred Astaire, but his right? His hands were, yeah. were him. And that was Paul. You can't get that in this movie. So I've never seen hands ever again like this. If I may, I can just ask you one more question. You have made a, um, you're basically telling us that they don't go together. And Am I telling you that? Yeah. It, it seems like you're telling us that. And it, or they and, haven't yet. And you're really. also yeah. saying, if I'm reading you correctly, that, um, you know, TAP has been, as you put it, marginalized, yeah. right? And I guess, I mean, you know, the question, I w you've raised several issues without quite telling us uh, yeah. about race right. and about um, the sort of social position of tap dance vis-a-vis -vis ballet. And I'm wondering if, you know, if tap hasn't quite made it in the way that ballet has. It or, or it did make it and then or it, it fell did off make it and, and it hasn't fell come off. back. Okay, you know? right, yeah. fair, of course. You show that so well in the book. Um, I mean, do you have a, a sort of sh sh not, you know, <laughs> Uh, do you have an answer for 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 why? We, I mean, is this a right an explanation for? for I mean, is this is this a, is this a sort of racist ra problem of racism? Is this a problem? I of think it has to be all, most of the dancers that right. you showed us were white. That's I'm true. trying to right. Well, I'm the, trying uh, to understand. There are almost no black tap dancers I was thinking about that that took something from ballet, and the ones I could think of actually are bad examples. There are these dancers in the '70s. Some stu studied at School of American Ballet, and they, they became like the worst kind of tap dancing for me, which is all this like high kicks and splits and pirouettes and no tap left. Um, and the ballet part is really shallow too. So you know, blacks can, can do that too, uh, take the wrong path. Um, now I've lost the question. Um, well, it sounds like maybe they should be separate. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, anything can, can mix, but... Yeah, uh, yeah, the history is not so great, maybe, yeah. Uh, actually, on this, sort of on this, uh, sort of on this topic, uh, my understanding is that TAP itself is a mixture of Irish, of course, dance, right, and right. black African origins. Right, it's already so a hybrid it, itself of, of, of uh, African and Irish. Yes. So is there something, so to speak, special about that hybridization that is prohibited in the ballet TAP? relationship or it's not prohibited but but um, precluded I think, I think um, what I was trying to get at in some ways is that the way that people tend what when they take things from ballet they give up some of what that hybrid what the strength of that hybrid is and that's sort of what I, what I meant to say about the weight thing right with with sinking uh, you know it's like uh, Irish dancers it's all up right right a tap dancer sinks and comes up, and that's something that that that's, that you don't see in Irish dancing. It comes from African dancing, uh, but you also don't see that in Africa. There's no tap in Africa. That was something that a uh, mixture that happened here, uh, and it's the strength of the form. Uh, and often when people do ballet and try to add ballet to it, they lose that. And when I see that lost, I feel like tap is lost. try to incorporate tap ever? And did any Americans ever go and, uh, as many black artists went to Europe and to France in particular, did they ever try to take tap there and integrate it with- With the, ballet? With the, na well, with some kind form of national dance in, in those countries. Uh, not that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, although I did say that there was this 
I did. Yeah. In Athens, Greece, I was brought there by Papandreos, uh, the permanent president of Greece. I do. And Papandreos brought me there to teach rhythm to the national company. And uh, I had to bone up on ancient manifest and test rhythms of ancient talking in Greece and apply it to tap. No, there, there are, there's a huge amount of global tap. I have a huge, a large, too large chapter in my book about that. Uh, but you meant like uh, actually people, ballet companies in other parts of the world. Yeah, not, not that I can think of. Yeah, not that I can think of actually. So like ladies and gentlemen, things. I think probably we should uh, uh, finish this for now. Please stay. We have some, uh, some things for you to eat and drink, and uh, we welcome you to stay for as long as you'd like. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you much, Ryan.